Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Asia Society. I'm Josette Sheeran, President and CEO here. Asia Society was founded more than six decades ago to build bridges of understanding and bridges over troubled waters. And our topic today is filled with many troubled waters as we discuss the U.S.-Iran relationship, the U.S. Uh, relationship to the Iran nuclear deal, and all the events that have unfolded since July 2015 when uh, that deal was signed with Six Nations in Switzerland, I believe. It's been an eventful uh, couple of days, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or the JCPOA, uh, as we know, President Trump announced that the U.S. would withdraw from that on May 8th, so just about a year ago. Our guest today, Dr. Mohammad Javed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, is no stranger to New York, having been Iran's ambassador to the UN for many years, and no stranger to this agreement as the lead negotiator through most parts of the agreement and the signer uh, in July 2015. Uh, this framework called for Iran to redesign convert and reduce its nuclear facilities in exchange for lifting nuclear-related sanctions and was famously called by candidate Trump the worst deal ever. Today we'll explore where this deal stands and Iran's views on a range of topics. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our trustees who are here today. Um, I see Denise Saul here, uh, Susan Hakaranian, Hamid Biglari, I think Luke Hayden is with us. I want to welcome our trustees who sustain and support this institution. Yes. <laughs> and our ASPE Council member, Charles Delaria, and also the many uh, academics and scholars on uh, Iran who have joined us today and are not strangers to this institution or this subject and topic. So welcome, everyone. I'm going to start with a few questions, and then if you have questions, there are cards and I think uh, your seats, have you all found those? Pass those out and our staff will collect those and pass those up. And for those of you who are watching on the internet, we invite you to send in your questions under hashtag Asia Live, Asia Live now, Sanjeev? Yes, and also to... Um, to send those in uh, over the internet, and they'll be passed up to me. <coughs> Mr. Minister, we've come a long way uh, since July 2015. Um, I would say relations continue in a negative spiral between the U.S. and Iran. And in fact, on Monday, the Trump team announced it's terminating sanctions waivers for eight major importers of Iran crude oil. China, India, Turkey, Japan, South Korea would be affected by this, about one million barrels a day. The U.S. Special Representative <coughs> Brian Hook briefed reporters yesterday and said until Iran starts behaving more like a normal nation and less like a revolutionary movement, uh, this uh, Cold War will continue. Could you uh, give us your perspective on where things are? But first of all, it's very good to be back uh, in Asia Society. First time I came here was in 1992, when I was Deputy Foreign Minister. So it's good to be back here again for, uh, after so many times being here. Um, I think what's important is for the U.S. to look at what it's saying, to listen to itself. It says, act like a normal state. But would a normal state withdraw from any international treaty they signed into? Uh, the U.S. has not just withdrawn from JCPOA. They like to justify it by saying that it was an executive agreement, that Congress never ratified it. But they have withdrawn from agreements that Congress has ratified. The INF Treaty. They've even withdrawn from UNESCO. Uh, I think uh, whatever you can name they have withdrawn from, the Paris Climate Convention. So who's not acting like a normal state? That's the first question that they have to answer. Uh, we were at the negotiating table. 
Brian Hook was there too himself uh, until last April. He did not expect to end that. He told my deputy that this would continue. He did not believe that his president would do what he did. So now he has to justify a policy that uh, basically is no policy. Uh, and it's a very dangerous policy. Uh, the United States has uh, not only violated a Security Council resolution, but it's calling on others to violate that. Sanctions this time that the U.S. is imposing is different from sanctions that it imposed in the past. Because in the past, the United States did not have any barrier from Security Council. It could even say that there are a number of Security Council resolutions calling for Iran to stop its uranium enrichment, and Iran is not uh, living by those resolutions. We disagreed with them, but at least they had that argument. Now there exists a Security Council resolution, which openly says that the purpose of the resolution is to normalize Iran's business relations. And it's ca it calls on all states to implement that resolution. Now, the United States is not only not complying itself, but it's saying that the rest of the world should not comply. And it's going a step further, saying that we will punish you if you comply. This is first time, to my knowledge, and I've dealt with the UN for the last 40 years, this is the first time that this is happening at the UN that a permanent member of the Security Council is openly calling on other countries to violate a Security Council resolution and threatening them with punishment if they didn't. So I think it's not for Iran to make that decision. It's for the rest of the international community to make a decision whether they want to allow this to happen or whether they want to stop somewhere. Now, we know that the United States is a big economic power. We know that the United States is a huge market. We know that nobody wants to lose the U.S. market. But the American government should understand that people are doing this out of desperation because they have no other choice. This is coercion, pure and simple. Do we want to build international relations on coercion? Do you think it's sustainable? These are important questions for anybody who's interested in long-term peace and stability in the world to ask if coercion is sustainable. As, as a diplomat who has devoted my life, and I, I know that you have to, we cannot accept that coercion is sustainable. We cannot accept that coercion should be the rule of the game. We're not idealists. We know that power play is a fact of life in, in international relations. But power has to be moderated by some sort of rules. Otherwise, will be living in a jungle. I do not want to repeat and bring you back to history. We had an empire ruling the world for much longer than the US has ever existed. And it ends. Empires end. We need to know whether we want to establish a modus operandi that would last longer than our empire. So are we, is this a stalemate with no possible resolution? Is this a cold war? Is this something that continues to devolve? Do you see any path or any issues that have been put on the table that can be discussed with the U.S.? Well, as I said, the U.S. left the table. The table is still there. It's not as if there is no table. The United States does not need a new table. The table is there. There is a resolution. There is an agreement. I mean, I negotiated all of that agreement. And I know that neither Iran nor the United States will ever get a better agreement. It's not an agreement that I like. I can assure you that with whatever good words President Trump put for Secretary Kerry, is not an agreement that Secretary Kerry liked. But it was the best agreement we could both reach with five other people in the room. It's a difficult process. We had competing interests, 
not just competing interests of Iran and, and the United States, but even competing interests between the United States and its own allies, its own European allies, competing interests between the United States and Russia and China. So there were a lot of competing interests came into play, and there were competing interests from outside. There were people, my new uh, concept of the B team, Bibi, Bolton, Bin Zayed, and uh, Bin Salman. The four Bs. <laughs> the Algerians now have a call that we do not want the three Bs. Now I think the world should not want the four Bs. <laughs> they, they didn't want it from the beginning. From day one, they didn't like this. But this was the best deal that we could achieve. And I think even in the future, this would be the best deal that can be achieved. President Trump may believe in his uh, what is deal-making abilities. But we have seen how it worked with North Korea. I mean, we do not want a photo op and a two-page document. We have many of those photo ops, we had them, and a 150-page document. It goes to every detail because it was based on mistrust. It wasn't based on trust. Nobody trusted the other side. And we shouldn't have trusted the other side. I mean, there is a history between Iran and the US. So nobody trusted the other side. We explained in rather meticulous detail everything that was, suppo was supposed to be done. And now the President Trump says he wants something better. Well, he may want something better, but unless he can dictate what he likes, he won't get it. So just to explore the status of Iran's approach to the U.S. withdrawal. You have decided to stay in the agreement with the other parties. You uh, have been working with Europe for the establishment of a special purpose vehicle that would allow for the economic benefits to flow from that. And I understand there's been a hiccup or two in the parliament in aligning uh, financial regulations that would enable that to happen. Could you give us your assessment on where you are with Europe and whether that seems to be staying the course and whether you think those financial benefits will flow? Um, we know that the IMF is predicting that the Iran economy may shrink 6% in this coming year, so I know this is a vital question. Well, uh, sanctions certainly impact our economy. Sanctions target ordinary people. Uh, and I think uh, the, the statements uh, by the, this administration that they uh, want uh, the benefit of it, the Iranian people notwithstanding, uh, they are targeting Iranian people. If this administration is interested in the Iranian people, they came out in huge numbers to the streets when we signed the deal. So Iranian people want JCPOA. If the U.S. is true to its uh, slogans that it wants to serve the Iranian people, nobody believes it. But if it's true, then JCPOA is the wish of the Iranian people. Uh, so this sanctions will hurt, no, no doubt about it. But will sanctions change policy? They won't. Never have, never will. Sanctions hurt ordinary people problem right now is that Europe made a number of promises last May after President Trump withdrew. Uh, promises to Iran. Promises to Iran that Iran will continue to enjoy the economic benefits of the JCPOA, the economic dividends. It has not been able to implement those promises. Now, this special purpose me mechanism, or as it's now called, INSTEX, Instrument to Support uh, Trade Exchange, is a prerequisite for those promises. It's not even those promises themselves. Prerequisite for those promises, and it's been a year in the making. Now, uh, the official uh, counterpart for that uh, mechanism was an Iranian mechanism. And that mechanism involves basically buying and selling without exchanging money. Not a barter system, but an advanced barter system. That is, those who purchase from Iran will pay 
to those who are selling to Iran rather than to their own Iranian counterparts. And the same would happen in Iran. So we had to establish a counterpart to Instex in Iran, and we have done that. So officially, it's, the problem is resolved. Now, uh, what you refer to as uh, FATF requirements uh, for Iran, uh, those are being addressed in Iran. Most of them have been implemented. They had 40, some 40, 41 conditions. We have done 39. Two are outstanding. Some other conditions are uh, dependent on these two that are outstanding, two international conventions that have to be ratified. Uh, it's gone through the parliament. One last stage is remaining, and there is a lot of debate about that. And the focus of that debate is Iran is not benefiting from the other agreements it entered into. Why should it enter into another agreement? This is the focus of the debate. There is nothing that we need to hide in our economic interactions, in our financial interactions. The question that is being asked is, why should we join another international agreement while we haven't benefited from the previous ones that we had joined? And this is a very difficult question even for me as a proponent of joining those agreements because I believe those are in our interest. We are in the forefront of fighting terrorism. We have fought Daesh. Yesterday, the government of Iraq invited 300 Iranian families who have lost their loved ones in fighting Daesh in Iraq. Has the United States received an invitation for a single family fighting, or, or your allies in the region, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, people who uh, this administration uh, is proud of? Have they fought Daesh? We were the only country that was fighting along with the Iraqis and the Syrians, and we have been in the forefront of fighting terrorism. So we have nothing against the Convention on, on Terrorism Financing or the Anti-Money Laundering Convention. The problem is they're saying that you're not benefiting from international conventions. You, you, we did not benefit from JCPOA. We did not benefit from NPT. We did not benefit from other conventions in which we were a, an active member. You see, 14 IAEA reports, 14 IAEA reports, and IAEA has never been very friendly to Iraq. This entire process started with IAEA, in our view, making an erroneous claim uh, in 2002. But 14 IAEA reports have said that Iran has faithfully implemented JCPOA and all its other international commitments uh, in, in nuclear non-proliferation. And the United States goes out and issues a report that Iran has not implemented those, after having said repeatedly that Iran is implementing. So the U.S. government is negating itself. Even Trump administration is negating itself. Even Secretary Pompeo time and again said Iran is, is observing. Now they're saying that Iran is violating non-proliferation regime. Well, that's, that's the problem. The problem is the Iranian people cannot determine whether being a member of the of these international agreements is worthy of the procedures we have to go through, uh, commitments that we need to make. One-sided commitments are very difficult to make. Let me ask you this. Um, one of the things that has characterized the U.S.-China trade tensions is a deliberate effort to de-escalate the language around it and to try to quietly see if there's pathways forward on issues. This has not characterized the U.S.-Iran relation. I mentioned a few quotes on the U.S. side. Uh, just today, the news is filled with a couple of quotes on the Iran side, accusing President Trump of Nazi-like behavior, the U.S. of economic terrorism, and again threats to close the Straits of Hormuz over this uh, last effort to um, try to put pressure on blocking the oil exports. Um, are these just words, or uh, it's affected markets, this idea that the strait may be affected by this? Um, what, what do these mean? How does the world read this kind of escalating language? Well, I think there's cause to be concerned. Uh, I think, uh, I doubt that President Trump wants conflict. He ran uh, on a campaign promise 
and it seems to me that he's very uh, careful to uh, at least try to implement his campaign promises. He ran on a campaign promise not to waste another $7 trillion in our region in order to make the situation only worse. Uh, so I guess he, he wants to stick to that commitment. Uh, he thinks, through further pressure on Iran, the so-called maximum pressure policy, he can bring us to our knees. Uh, his mistake. We have 7,000 years of history. We've had battles. We've had losses. We've had victories. Usually we haven't come to our knees. And this won't be a, an aberration of that. We don't look at history in terms of two, four, and six-year terms as usually uh, people do, whether they're members of Congress or in the administration or in the Senate. Uh, we look at history in millennia, uh, and our dignity is not up for sale. President Trump believes that by pushing us, by imposing economic pressure on us, we will sell our dignity. Not going to happen. Even if I wanted to do that, the Iranian people won't let me do it. So he's not, he shouldn't try to put pressure on the government. He is actually putting pressure on the Iranian people because he knows where the determination is. Determination doesn't come from me. It comes from the Iranian people. It comes from their history. So this, this is the reality of the situation. President Trump believes putting pressure, bullying, will bring us to the negotiating table so that he can make that ideal deal that he has in mind. And I don't know what that ideal deal is. I mean, if he wants us to call JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action, JCAP, that is easier to pronounce, Joint Comprehensive Action Program, then he's welcome to do it. <coughs> As he did with NAFTA, basically. I mean, maybe it's easier. We, we should have called it JCAP to begin with. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but. If he wants to push Iran into accepting a new deal that would be selling our dignity, then we won't be able to do it. And then plan B of the B team will come into play. I believe the B team does not have the same plan as President Trump does. President Trump has a plan, but he is being lured into not a plan, but a plot, which will cost another $7 trillion and even a greater disaster. So what is the plot of the B team? Plot is to push Iran into uh, taking action and then use that, or even to... Uh, but Iraq used that in the 80s, right? Tried to provoke Iran into... Um, uh, closing the strait, and Iran didn't do that, but there have been a few incidents. No, no, there have been a few incidents, but the point is, Persian Gulf is our lifeline. It's the world's lifeline, 30% of the world's oil. Yeah, but, but it's our lifeline, and it's called Persian Gulf, and we repeat the word Persian so that people know it's not Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> people just call it the Gulf because it's easier and people confuse that it may be the Gulf of Mexico that we're talking Some do about. call it the Arabian Gulf. Uh, I mean, they, they want to revise history. I mean, names in geography. I, I mean, uh, I, I, have a, I have a notepad by the king of Saudi Arabia. At that time, he wasn't the king. He says, Riyadh, Persian Gulf. Uh, at that time, Saudi Arabia did not exist. Another one says, Kuwait, Persian Gulf. I mean, this is this is the name. Why why are we so childish calling calling some place? I mean, it's as if I say the Gulf of Oman, on which we have much more coastline than Oman, is called Gulf of Iran. I mean, these are historical names. It doesn't have any other connotation other than the fact that the U.S. should know it's not Gulf of Mexico. It's 
It's right next to us. So it is our what? lifeline. It is our lifeline. So stability of Persian Gulf, freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf, free flow of oil in the Persian Gulf is in our vital national security interest. So do you but, guarantee that? Yeah, we guarantee it as long as it is in our vital national security interest. If we are prevented from using Persian Gulf, from our national security, for our national security, then why should we guarantee it? So just to be clear, if nations that the U.S. has put pressure on, such as Japan and South Korea, do not purchase the oil, is that considered a action that affects your national interest? We believe that Iran will continue to sell its oil. We will continue to find buyers for our oil. And we will continue to use the Strait of Hormuz as a safe transit passage for the sale of our oil. That is our intention, and that is what we believe will happen. But if the United States takes the crazy measure of trying to prevent us from doing that, then it should be prepared for the consequences. What does prevent mean? I just want to be clear on... Well, I mean, the United States may take... Uh, the B team wants the United States to take crazy measures. And, and it's, crazy it won't be measure. the first time that the United States has taken adventurous measures, plotted for it by others. So I don't want to enter into hypotheses. What I'm saying is it is in our interest, our it's our vital national security interest to keep the Persian Gulf open, to keep the Strait of Ormuz open. We've done that in the past. We will continue to do it in the future. But the United States should know that when they enter the Strait of Hormuz, they have to talk to those who are protecting the Strait of Hormuz. And that is Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So uh, the US in March negotiated with Oman to have greater access to the ports there. And you're defining that transit through that 21-mile stretch as kind of a red line. No, no, no. They, I mean, when they come through, the, our, our rules of engagement in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Ormuz hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So channels of communications are open. They enter through... Uh, arrangements with Iran, they leave through arrangements with Oman. That's their choice. Well, we're going to come to the audience in a moment. Let's see if we can find some brighter lining in this. We'll try. Um, <laughs> but before we leave um, the I Gulf... I said the, channel, the, the rules of the game has not changed. The rules of engagement have not changed. So they continue to behave. There's no reason for us to seek confrontation. So that's your silver lining. Okay. Well, um, let me just ask on the Belt and Road, which has had quite a, a lot of activity around the, the Gulf. What is Iran's view on Belt and Road? Are you participants? And are there key projects that you've been interested in? Well, uh, I think Belt and Road Initiative is an important initiative. It's a strategic initiative for China. President, President Xi has put it on first uh, top of its priorities, so, and we consider that to be positive. Uh, they're uh, investing a great deal in the region. Uh, they have a number of projects in Iran, including uh, industrial projects, transit projects in Iran. You know, we connect uh, the Sea of Oman uh, through Chabahar port, which has up till now been exempted from U.S. sanctions, to Europe both uh, St. Petersburg as well as uh, Black Sea, uh, and also Turkey. So this, this is a strategic uh, transit corridor. We have other transit corridors that are connecting east and west. We just agreed with the Iraqis to connect our railroad to the Iraqi railroad, which means that connecting our railroad to the entire regional railroad. Uh, these are important development projects which will not only bring economic development, but fight terrorism.
because if you consider the place where Chabahar is and where Pakistani port of Gwadar is, this is a hotbed of terrorism. And much of terrorism in that particular region, uh, which connects also to Afghanistan, is because of lack of economic development. Mm -hmm. So if we can develop through the Belt and Road Initiative, those areas, we have done a major blow, we have dealt a major blow, blow to extremist terror in Pakistan, in parts of Iran, foreign sponsored in parts of Iran, and in Afghanistan. Thank you. Let's broaden the lens a bit. And we have a question from Tom O'Connor of Newsweek who asks, does Iran have any specific plans to build regional ties after the Baghdad summit? And where does Iran see itself in a world where Russia and China are increasingly challenging the U.S.? But we believe that it's not just Russia and China. Everybody is fed up with unilateralism. The meeting today in the United Nations is called Celebrating Multilateralism. Uh, that's why I'm here. So the, the, the rest of the world is not very happy uh, with, with unilateralist policies of the United States. And Iran is a part of that part of the world, which is, uh, I think, outside uh, probably parts of the Beltway. Everybody else wants that type of the world to, uh, to live in. Uh, so the, we, we are a part of, 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 the, of the regional uh, scenario, we are a part of the global scenario. But in our region, we have suggested a regional dialogue forum in the Persian Gulf. Uh, I, I made that suggestion about five years ago, uh, and we stick to that suggestion. That proposal is on the table. It can even reach a non-aggression pact. If our neighbors are ready for a non-aggression pact with Iran, we are ready for a non-aggression pact with them, including Saudi Arabia, including the United Arab Emirates. We have no problem with them because we have, we're, we're satisfied with our size, we're satisfied with our geography, we're satisfied with our natural resources. We don't have any reason to have any uh, ambition, territorial ambition with anybody else. So the, these are facts on the ground. We have very good relations with Turkey. We've never had such a good relation in the, in the past 40 years. We have extremely good relations with Pakistan. We never had such a good relation with Pakistan in the past 40 years. And I've been following, I mean, I've been involved in Iranian foreign policy for the past 40 years. We've never had such good relations with Azerbaijan. We've never had such good relations with uh, uh, Russia. We've never had such good relations with Iraq. Our relations with Afghanistan are excellent. I mean, situation in Afghanistan is not... Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that beautiful, uh, wrong policies by the United States, seriously wrong policies by the United States, wrong approach, an attempt to put, to exclude everybody and just talk to the Taliban, has alienated the government, has alienated the region, has alienated everybody else, and it achieved nothing, as you've seen from the statement that came from the Taliban, from the uh, measures that were taken by the Taliban. I was first to say that in any peace in Afghanistan, Taliban cannot be uh, set aside or isolated. But you cannot negotiate the future of, of Afghanistan with the Taliban. I mean, the Taliban represent only a segment of Afghan society, not all of it. You cannot exclude the government. You cannot exclude the other uh, groups in Afghanistan and just talk to the Taliban. This is wrong. We are talking to the Taliban. We have official relations with the Taliban. But it doesn't mean that we talk about the future of Afghanistan with Taliban without talking to the government or without talking to other groups. So our, our approach to security and stability is regional, not unilateral. We have a multilateral approach to our security. We do not participate in meetings on Afghanistan where the Afghan government is not present. That's the principle. We do not participate in meetings about our neighbors when we're not present. We had better relations with the United States during the previous administration, but we never spoke to the previous administration about the region without the presence of the region. That's our policy. We don't decide about our region. We believe the region has to decide about itself. One area that key players in the region have agreed on is that ISIS is, needs to be removed from the region. What is your understanding of the status of ISIS and what happened in Sri Lanka? What's your understanding of the connection there? Unfortunately, 
we've been saying that and we people believe that we were just trying to make propaganda and a conspiracy theory uh, approach that ISIS has been airlifted from Iraq and Syria into Afghanistan. Now you see one uh, example of it unfortunately in a barbaric attack uh, on Easter Sunday uh, in, in Sri Lanka. But, but unfortunately the people of Afghanistan are seeing incident after incident, terrorist attack after terrorist attack by ISIS directed uh, against particular sects in Afghanistan in order to create the sectarian war that ISIS has been looking for ever since Zarqafi started this process in 2002. So we need to be very careful about what we are doing. I think this game that the United States is playing, I mean, this obsession with Iran that is being pursued is causing serious difficulty. And the consequences of this obsession will go far beyond Iran. We know how to protect ourselves. You know, people should remember, when I talk about history, people say, why do you talk about history? But history is a good lesson. People should remember that Right after our revolution, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. At that time, the United States supported him, Ro Soviet Union supported him. I mean, I usually use this. He was fighting Iran with U.S. AVAC surveillance information, Soviet MiG fighters, French Exocet missiles, British chieftain tanks, and German chemical weapons. So you name it, we're behind him. Where is he now? What did he do after he failed to attack Iraq? What did Taliban do? What did Al-Qaeda do? What did ISIS do? What is happening in Yemen? Who is paying the price? When will the United States stop making the wrong choices? These are repetitions of the same scenario. Just the names have changed. I mean, two names are constant, Iran and the U.S. Everybody else has changed. Saudi Arabia provided $75 billion, $75 billion to Saddam Hussein to fight us. What did he do? Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and President Trump is very happy to name them, were the ones who recognized the Taliban. What did that bring to the United States? Even then they did it on behalf of the United States. What did that bring the United States? So I, I think we need to be a bit more farsighted. I think the United States does not need to have this policy. It's not serving the interest of the United States. Which in policy? The policy of being obsessed with Iran. The policy, I mean, there was a revolution. The U.S. used to rule Iran. Now it's not. But that doesn't have to mean the U.S. has to be obsessed with Iran, try to undermine Iran, try to do every mistake to correct the mistake of having a coup in 1953 and bringing the Shah to power so that uh, when he was removed, the United States had to be uh, withdrawn, uh, had to withdraw from Iran. I mean, mistake after mistake. I mean, you do not correct a mistake by another mistake. You need, you need to look at what can be done. I mean, United States wants stability in Iraq. United States believes that the current Iraqi government is its ally. Now, you saw how the current Iraqi government hosted me and hosted our president. I didn't spend several hours in, in Iraq. I spent five days. I went to five Iraqi major cities. Our president did not stay in Iraq for a few hours, going to a camp, at the, uh, to a military base in the dark of night and leaving. Our president stayed in Iraq for three days. He went to public places. He met with tribal chiefs in addition to the government. So, it, if the United States believes that it's an ally of the Iraqi government, if the United States believes that it wants to have stability in Iraq, exactly what we want. If the United States believes that it wants stability in Afghanistan, 
That's exactly what we want. If the United States believes that it wants stability in the Persian Gulf, if the United States believes that Strait of Hormuz has to be free to uh, commercial navigation, that's our national, vital national security. So why is it that they are obsessed with Iran in the interest of the, of the B team? I think it, I mean, it's, I mean, just look at it. B team is not a slogan. B team is, is pushing US policy towards a disaster. Tell me again who's in the B team. BB, Bolton, Bin Zayed, Bin Salman. So I have to say there seems to be a mutual obsession. <laughs> no, I don't have an obsession with living. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are, are countless speeches in Iran about the axis of evil between the U.S., Israel, Saudi Arabia. What, what is that about? Well, you see, we, have, we do not have a new administration in Iran. The same administration negotiated. So this prop- is a consistent No, no, no. Sense. We, we negotiated a treaty an agreement with the United States that was called by everybody as a historic achievement. The JCPOA, if you look at the history but just of the last... more broadly, if we can, just for one more moment, broadly, okay. about this issue of Being bad obsessed. relations between <laughs> Israel, Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and Iran. It is, you see, the problem. Who supported Saddam Hussein? Who supported Daesh? Who's, who is bombing the people in Yemen? They, they say Iran is providing weapons to Houthis. We reject that, but let's take that. But we're not bombing Yemen. Our planes are not there. Our pilots are not there. Saudi pilots are there. But why, why are you blaming us? Let me give you an example from the previous administration. Uh, I haven't said this publicly, but uh, this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. Secretary Kerry and I spent two days during the most difficult days and, and the most time-limited days of our negotiations in 2014, when we, were meet, when we had to meet an April 1st deadline of Congress before they imposed heavier permanent sanctions. We spent two very precious days negotiating how to end the Yemen war although I did not negotiate with Secretary of State on any regional issue. But this was something that I believed was going to be a humanitarian catastrophe. So we agreed. I went back to Iran after we finished those negotiations, and I was about to board a plane to Indonesia when John Kerry called me and said, we have an okay from Saudi Arabia to have a ceasefire. I called my deputy because I was boarding the plane. And I told him, if John Kerry calls you, go ahead. Tell the Yemenis who had promised us that they would observe to stop the war. Boarded the plane. Eight hours later, I was in Jakarta. Called my deputy. Said Secretary Kerry didn't call. Called John Kerry. He said, unfortunately, Saudis reneged. Fine. This is April 2014, just when the war started in Yemen. Uh, April 2015. Sorry. Now Yemen is into its fourth year. What did they say? They said, we'll beat these guys within three, four weeks. So now it's three years and some. And the war is continuing. But my point is, The following day, President Obama had a press conference. He accused Iran of waging war in Yemen. So yesterday, your allies reneged. Why are you accusing Iran? We wanted peace. At that time, it wasn't the B team. (laughs) So I'm not obsessed with the B team. The B team is operating today. It's an obsession on the part of the United States to contain Iran, to take action against Iran, it doesn't work. 
It started with the revolution. It has, it has continued. It, it started in 1953. People like to start history at a certain point. So let's start at the point that we agree with. 53. You want to start with 53? You'll start at 53. You want to start with the revolution? We start with the revolution. You want to start with the nuclear negotiations? We start with the nuclear negotiations. We that's, but by the way, that's why I do not make an opening statement, because I tell everybody that I'm long-winded in my answer, so I don't need to make a long-winded <laughs> opening statement. Well, you've been very, you're known as the patient diplomat, and you've been very patient up here right now. We have a ton of questions. Okay. I would say they group I in. I have to leave in 10 yes, minutes exactly. to speak to the UN. In, so I'll make short answers. So they group in a few areas. Okay. Lots of questions about the 2020 re elections in the U.S., whether Iran sees that as perhaps a change in U.S. policy, an opportunity. Let me, let me just make one small com comment. I don't interfere in the internal affairs of the U.S., but believe me, we have not invested in a 2020 democratic victory. Some people believe that we are looking for a democratic victory. Democratic governments have been as hostile to Iran as and uh, Republican governments. We're not investing in anybody. It's not waiting for a Democrat to go to the White House. It's just waiting for the White House to become rational with a Republican or a Democrat. How long do you think you will have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you won't, I don't. <laughs> So the famed Edith letter, wherever you are, from the Associated Press asked, do you see the increased pressure from the U.S. aimed at regime change or at talks? Depending on uh, who, whose aim. President Trump's aim is to bring us to our knees to talk. B team wants regime change at the very least. They so, want disintegration of Iran as their object. How do you see President Trump? That's interesting. I mean, I think many see him as someone who wants to get to a deal yeah. on these key issues. Do you? I, I think he does, but I think he's going the wrong way. Iranians do not, I mean, I've said it even when I was ambassador here. We're allergic to pressure. <laughs> don't, don't put pressure on it. Try the language of respect. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the government. It won't kill you. Believe me. President Rouhani said today, according to Adam via email, that Iran is ready to return to negotiations if the U.S. lifts pressure from Iran. What specific pressures and... Um, sanctions no, or the more? No, pre the president said that uh, exactly what I said, that U.S. was the party that left the negotiations. Negotiation table is there. The United States will have to make up its mind whether it wants to obey international agreements, whether it wants to live up uh, to its commitments, or whether it wants to put pressure. I mean, pressure policy won't reach a conclusion, at least a positive conclusion. We have a question that goes from the unprecedented floods. Um, our sympathies go out to Thank the you. Iranian people Thank and the suffering that has happened with those, uh, to the environmental challenges and the uh, imprisonment of some environmental activists um, and wondering if the Rouhani uh, government is looking to secure their release. Well, uh, let me first of all say that we are grateful to the sympathies uh, of the American people. Uh, and people of the world on, on the flood situation. Let me also tell you that the United States government has prevented a single dollar to be transferred to Iranian Red Crescent Society, even from the Iranian expatriate community in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world. People come to our embassies with cash. Uh, my colleagues in, uh, in, in Frankfurt where I uh, transited yesterday were telling me that uh, a taxi driver came, a Pakistani taxi driver, came to their doorsteps with a thousand euros in cash, saying that I want to help the, the Iranian floods. Why did he have to come with cash? Because he cannot 
transfer the money in a... And, and the U.S. Is, uh, says it's against money laundering. This is promotion of money laundering. <laughs> so um, this, is, this, is, this shows you the extent of hostility. And it's, it's not a regular flood. I mean, in one day, 24 Iranian provinces were facing a flood. I think the fact that we have such a low, even one casualty is one too high, but had such a low casualty number, 76 or 77, shows the, the crisis management that we were able to do. I mean, people, I mean, Secretary Pompeo, just, I mean, they gave him these nonsense notes and he repeats them, accused us of mismanagement. What mismanagement? Look at Katrina. What are you talking about, mismanagement? Now, on, on environmentalists, you see, Secretary Pompeo, day before yesterday, said in a meeting with Iranians that if he is plotting a coup in Iran, he wouldn't tell them. He didn't deny. I mean, the Iranians asked him, are you plotting a coup in Iran? He said, if I were plotting a coup, I wouldn't tell you. It's on the record. Now, somebody has to plot this coup. Our intelligence and our courts believe that the number of prisoners that they have imprisoned on, on espionage charges are responsible. I have no way of knowing. I have no way of saying that they're right. I have no way of saying that they're wrong. Not my job. And this is not just trying to evade responsibility. It's not my job. I have enough headache trying to avoid a war and trying to help our people fight hunger that the United States wants to bring upon them. But I can involve myself on these issues as a foreign minister other than on humanitarian grounds, which have always been involved, and people know that, when there is a possibility of an exchange. Because we have a separate judiciary, and the judiciary says that they, are, they have com uh, committed offenses, espionage, whatever. I may not agree with that, but that's not my job. My job is to try to arrange for a deal, an exchange. I did it once. We, ex we reached an agreement. And believe me, there are Iranians in, in prison in the United States on sanctions violation charges. In Europe, there is an Iranian with a heart condition in a European jail waiting for extradition to the United States whose, whose charge is to try to buy spare parts for airplanes, not, not fighter jets, civilian airplanes, so that people could fly safely. That's his charge. He's lingering in prison in Germany on, a, on an extradition request. We have an Iranian lady in Australia who gave birth to a child in prison, not even on bail, inside prison on an extradition request by the United States because she was responsible as a translator in a, whatever, uh, in a purchase operation, purchase of some transmission equipment for Iranian broadcasting company. That is, that's her charge. She's been lingering in an, in an Australian jail for the past three years. Now, we hear about Nazanin Zaghari and her child and I feel sorry for them, and I've done my best to help, but nobody talks about this lady in Australia who's, who gave birth to a child in prison, whose child is growing up outside prison with his mother, with, uh, mother in prison. So what can I do as a foreign minister? And I put this offer on the table publicly now. Exchange them. All these people that are in prison on inside the United States, on extradition requests from the United States. We believe their charges are phony. The United States believe the charges against these people in Iran are phony. Why? 
Let's not discuss that. Let's have an exchange. I'm ready to do it. And I have authority to do it. We've informed the government of the United States six months ago that we are ready. Not a response yet. If they tell you anything else, they're lying. Given what you have said, which is this deep level of hostility right now, have the dangers of miscalculation in this relationship risen to a crisis point? Is this um, in your experience? And how, what would be your main way of diffusing that? How, how do you talk to the U.S. right now? Well, I think uh, we are not at a, I mean, it's not a crisis yet, but it's a dangerous situation. Uh, accidents plotted accidents are possible. I wouldn't discount the B team plotting an accident anywhere in the region, particularly as we get closer to the election here. So dangers are there. We're not there yet. They're still hoping. I mean, Pre uh, uh, Ambassador Bolton went to this terrorist group, MEK, last year, before, just before becoming national security advisor, and promised them that in 2019, he would celebrate with them inside Iran. That's the type of convoluted, crazy thinking that they have. Now, it's about 40, four months after the promised day, and I'm here talking to you, instead of he talking to them in Tehran. So, Mr. Minister, our time is almost up. You, as I've mentioned, are known as the patient diplomat. But in February, you resigned in a tweet. <laughs> and my question would be, not so much why did you resign. We have many experienced diplomats in the room. Why would you come back <laughs> into a situation that seems almost impossible to navigate, given? Uh, we diplomats never give up hope. Uh, for a better future. I, I had to resign because I thought uh, the integrity of my office was in question. Uh, when the integrity of my office was admitted to by everybody, I saw no justification. Man, all of us may want to leave. It's a tough job. Nothing, I mean, I don't think anybody would envy my position, particularly when I have to deal with the B team. <laughs> but I, I wish it was the A team at least. <laughs> but once I have no excuse, I have to do whatever I can in order to prevent conflict, to see if we can resolve conflicts peacefully, diplomatically. And I have a lot of hope. I believe <laughs> during the negotiations on nuclear deal, I said, we diplomats always make the right choice after having exhausted all the wrong choices. <laughs> now, I do not believe that there are many wrong choices left to make. So my hope is that after Washington has exhausted all the wrong choices, they may come to the right choice. And in Let's end on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank our audience. Thank because you. we had many unanswered questions, including relations with Pakistan and others in the area. We could have spent another hour. I want to thank you, Mr. Minister, for uh, being with us, giving us preciously of your time. And please join me in thanking him for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Exchange again. I spent a lot of sleepless nights in order to get him and his wife out of Iran. I will do it again if I'm given a chance by this administration. So go to Washington, not come to me.